we go. Report. Hello, welcome to um, episode seven, <laughs> Providence and Prophecy. Uh, we are fully into prophecy now. Uh, we're going all the way back to Jan Daniel chapter two uh, to pick up the first big prophecy in the book of Daniel. Uh, and the nice thing about Daniel chapter two is of, of all the, the different big prophecies in the book of Daniel, uh, I think Daniel chapter two is probably one of the easier ones to understand. And it also can kind of serve as a, um, oh, maybe a, a framework for understanding the, the prophecies to come. Uh, some some historical some historical landmarks and also just a, a structure that you that I think we're going to see a couple of times. Um, so we are uh, going to be working on Daniel chapter seven, and our our big idea for Daniel chapter seven. Uh, I'll uh, share my screen here with you. You can see that. And so our, our, our big idea is just history is littered with the wrecks of those who attempted to predict the future. Uh, my favorite one is the, the one that uh, my dad, Pastor Pete, will refer to every once in a while of, of uh, the, the, the guy who published all kinds of, of uh, pamphlets entitled 88 Reasons the World Will, will End in 1988. Um, and uh, when, then when that didn't happen, uh, the next year there came out with uh, the 89 Reasons in 89. Um, didn't happen in 89 either. So when uh, we human beings try to predict the future, um, doesn't usually go very well. Uh, God, however, you know, the future is not a mystery to God. Uh, in this episode of our study of Daniel, we'll see God do what only God can, predict the future with perfect accuracy. And what will the reaction to this miracle be? Um, so that's kind of where we're at. And uh, we'll start um, in uh, the, the first half of the chapter, uh, Daniel chapter 2, verses 1 to 23 and read kind of a chunk there and uh, uh, kind of get into it that way. So Daniel chapters two, starting at verse one. And uh, you'll notice too, uh, this is going all the way back to the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. So we've, we've, talked, about, um, uh, we've talked about Nebuchadnezzar and his whole lifetime. We've talked about his, uh, we've read about his, uh, um, one of his successors, Belshazzar and the writing on the wall and the, and the fall of the, the Babylonian empire. Uh, and the, the rise of the Persian Empire, and that Daniel was thrown to the lions uh, during the Persian Empire. This is all the way back to the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. Um, so, getting back to that. So, in the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. Uh, his mind was troubled, and he could not sleep. So, the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I've had a dream that troubles me, and I want to know what it means. Then the astrologers answered the king, may the king live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will interpret it. The king replied to the astrologers, this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your homes turned into piles of rubble. But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you will receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. Once more, they replied, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will interpret it. Then the king answered, I am certain that you are trying to gain time because you realize that this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me the dream, there is only one penalty for you. You have conspired to tell me misleading and wicked things, hoping the situation will change. So then tell me the dream, and I will know that you can interpret it for me. The astrologers answered the king, there's no one on earth who can do what the king asks. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer. What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not live among humans. This made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death, and men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. When Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. He asked the king's officer, why did the, issue, the king issue such a harsh decree? Arioch then explained the matter to Daniel. 
At this, Daniel went into the king and asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven and said, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, God of my ancestors. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we asked of you. You have known, made known to us the dream of the king. So, 1 to 23. Um, topic number one, madness. Or is it? Um, Nebuchadnezzar is in just year two of his reign. It seems like he's gone crazy already. Is he some kind of raving despot? Why would he make this impossible request instead of just telling them the dream and letting them interpret it? It's it, it, he, he's he's definitely insistent on that, and he's uh, in some ways he almost seems unreasonable, um, and that, at least that's how the uh, all of his magicians and enchanters and all that uh, feel about it. To answer that question, considering consider the following two questions: What were the magicians, enchanters, sorcerer, sorcerers, and astrologers supposed to be able to do? Say, no. Yeah, you were muted before. Oh, read his mind. They're supposed to be able to do now. Now, are you saying that as like, you know, that's what he expects or that's what they actually are supposed to be able to do? Oh. I'm just okay. clarifying for me. For, for, from you. <laughs> well, maybe they brag that they can do stuff like that. I don't know. See, there's there's the thing. Yeah, when, when we think of a magician, we usually think, <laughs> you know, is this your card? That's not what these magicians are. These are much more like the uh, the magicians of Pharaoh, right? Who they were able to imitate some of the plagues, right? Magicians, enchanters, um, sorcerers, astrologers. What, what are they supposed to be able to do? They're supposed to have some access to greater knowledge, greater power. They're supposed to have something that they can use. Right now, if they weren't doing that, if they didn't have that power, or they or that power was not available to them or reliable for them or whatever, what might they be doing to the new king Nebuchadnezzar instead? And here, I think a good uh, right here in verse uh, nine. Nebuchadnezzar says, you have conspired to tell me misleading and wicked things, hoping the situation will change. So then tell me the dream and I know and, and I will know that you can interpret it for me. So you've got people claiming that they have supernatural power. What is Nebuchadnezzar doing? Prove it. He's, exactly. <laughs> He's calling them on it. He said, if you have that power, prove it. Not only do I want you to interpret the dream for me, I want you to tell me what the dream is. If you can tell me what the dream is, then I will believe you that you have this supernatural power. If you don't, well, it's like, um, yeah, that, then I, I I could tell you that, um, you know, once when I was a kid, I had a dream. It's one of the most vividly remembered dreams that I have. I, I had a dream as a kid that I could swim through air like you swim through water. And mm -hmm. I had a dream that I, I I jumped off of my bunk bed as a kid. I swam through the house and I swam all the way down the road to my school bus stop. And, and since I told you that dream, now all of you could probably come up with something that that dream means. And if you were selfish or perhaps ambitious people, you could come up with something that that dream means that would benefit you. See, 
Or you could say something that would in some way mess with my head or, or try to influence me. For you know, So you've got this rather new king, um, whether he was young in actual age or just young in his power, perhaps he's feeling a bit more vulnerable. But one way or another, what we can see from his words is he doesn't trust these guys. He thinks they're working against him. And so what he's saying to them is not some just crazy thing. He's saying, you're claiming you can do it? Do it. Show me. Prove it. And if you can't, then I have no use for you. Off with all of your heads. So um, I'm not saying that uh, that that um, uh, Nebuchadnezzar isn't uh, isn't a crazy despot. I mean, in some ways, he's he, he kind of is. But there's a method to his madness. Um, so now. Uh, as kind of an illustration of what might be going on, uh, what do the following sentences mean? Uh, how about from this meme? Let's eat grandma, let's eat grandma, commas save lives. Everybody see that one? So one of them says, let's eat grandma with no commas. And the other one says, let's eat comma, grandma. In the first one, they're saying, let's eat grandma, let's eat her, <laughs> right? In the second one, they're speaking to grandma and saying, grandma, let's eat, right? Depending on where you put that punctuation, they're the same words, but the meaning could be different, right? We'll now scroll down a little bit. And we've got this from, oh, that's not the Oracle at Delphi. Um, I can't remember what it was. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll change that uh, in the question if anybody's curious, but it's the Oracle at Delphi was a uh, more Greek. This was a, a Latin uh, Oracle. So again, people claiming that they can tell the future and the, uh, the, the words in Latin, um uh ibis uh redibis numquam per bella peribis which means you will go you will return never in war you will perish what does that mean well yeah. if you put a comma after you will return it will say you will go you will return Never in war will you perish, right? So that, if you put the comma there and say, you will go, you will return, great, good news, right? What happens if you put the, the, the comma after never? Well, then it says, you will, re you will go, you will return never, in war you will perish. It means the completely opposite thing depending on how you read it. This is uh, this is a famous example of how the the ancient oracles who were trying to predict the future or convince people that they could predict the future, they were really just like horoscopes. Um, in in some cases, that they were just going, "I'm going to tell you something, and then you can believe what you want." Uh, so, an example of what could be could have been happening to Nebuchadnezzar. There. Any questions there so far? So, is this kind of setting the stage for? why there's this big showdown between Nebuchadnezzar and uh, and everyone else. Could so. some of those, could mm -hmm. some of those, what do we want to call them, magicians or whatever, could they do some of these things, but with the power of Satan? Just as, um, that, that's something we definitely can't rule out because we have biblical examples of it, right? We have um, um, the magicians and enchanters of Pharaoh, uh, in Exodus, um, I think Balaam would also be a, a good example. That uh, uh, this this was this was what Balaam did, and and it it certainly doesn't seem like he only worked with the Lord our God, uh, but he was a he was more of a prophet for hire, right? Um, so, and then you have also just the examples of uh, demon possession, it, the demon possession in the New Testament, um, the um, Example of the young girl in Philippi who was uh, possessed by a demon that uh, at least had some limited ability to to predict the future. So, so yeah, there. Um, we definitely don't want to discount the idea that some of this was possible. However, in this case, Nebuchadnezzar is trying to call their bluff, and uh, the Lord our God makes certain that that bluff gets called. That they're they're attached to the wrong deity. 
Uh, and speaking of wrong deity, um, you know, second second kind of thing concept, uh, comparative religion. Um, anybody that's ever led a Bible study has gotten a question about what's the difference between Christianity and fill in the blank. Um, always happens because we're curious and we want to know what the what the differences are. Um, and and yet, since the world is so full of religions and even so so filled with different flavors of Christianity, that can be a hard question to answer. You know, what's the difference between Christianity and I don't know Hinduism, and you just go, okay, that's a huge question, right? The best answer, though, is often found when we we look closely at the Bible and see what is truly unique about our faith. Um, what what is the difference between is is a huge question. What is a difference between what is what is a a practical difference between this and this that you can see that you can use that works? Um, I think we can see one of those here. So compare the reactions of the pagan wise men in verses 10 and 11 to the response of Daniel and his friends in 17 and 18. Uh, so let's look at those passages first. So 10 and 11, you've got the astrologers. Uh, they say they answered the king. There is no one on earth who can do what the king asks. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer. What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not live among humans. So that's there's their response. And then uh, 17 and 18, and I'm actually just going to go in here, and if you're looking at the screen with me, I'm just going to delete those so that they're next to each other. I'll bring them back in a second. So then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. So, 10 and 11 verses 17 and 18. Pagan astrologers and um, Daniel and, and uh, the Lord our God. Um, compare the reactions. What's unique about Daniel's relationship with God when you compare it to the religion of the wise men? Well, he's going <clears> to <throat> approach God and ask for his mercy so that they won't be killed. <laughs> All right. He, he actually has the confidence to ask. Notice <clears throat> that the astrologers know that they didn't even bother to ask. So they just went, this is not possible. Right? So there's a difference in, in, uh, in faith there. Um, why would... What what you know, and then you think about it, why would Daniel and and uh um Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, why would they why would they even think to ask? Um and, and ultimately it goes right back to the uh um goes right back to the, the Lord's Prayer in a way. You know, we, we say the Lord's Prayer and we say, Our Father. And I, I don't know that we always think about how amazing and unique that truly is. Um. Yeah, that, like like Luther said, that we can approach God with the 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 freedom and confidence of a of a dear child who speaks to its dear dear father. Um, that we approach God with the assumption that God loves us. What an amazing privilege that is! What a totally unique thing that is. The, these astrologers and and magicians and all that they are not approaching their higher powers under the assumption that those higher powers love them. They are approaching them under the assumption, these are powers that we must manipulate and will or will not perhaps do what we want if we buy them off properly, right? Um, it's just a completely different uh, relationship. And um, I, I just don't know that we always appreciate that as much as we should. Uh, that our that our God truly does have a relationship of love uh, with us. Anybody else have any uh, other thoughts about those those uh, two? All right, I'll bring the other passages back and then uh, come back here. Oh, uh, and I guess what causes that uniqueness? If if you're still wondering, God loves you. 
that is why your relationship with God is unique compared to all the other uh, religions in the world. Um, there, there is no other God of grace. There just isn't. Um, only, only the God of the Bible, only the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are the God of undeserved love, the God of grace. Which leads to doxology time. Um, in uh, Daniel 2, 20 to 23, we have another model prayer by Daniel. You know, what, what, is, what is the focus of that prayer? Um, so we've got uh, Daniel praying here. Um, Praise the God of heaven and said, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, God of my ancestors. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we asked of you. You have made known to us the name of you. Um, focus of Daniel's prayer is praise. Um, just to say to his God, you are great. You are wonderful. You have done for me what I asked of you and and yeah, giving that that credit and praise. Um, and I find it fascinating too what specifically Daniel praises God for. Not only the obvious one, which is um, giving us exactly what we asked for, right? I mean, we all love it when we pray to God and then, you know, exactly what we wanted happens. Um, this one, I think, is fantastic. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. Um, Daniel had thought this through. You know, the, the, he, here's Nebuchadnezzar flexing his muscles, saying to other people in his court, in his, his governmental orbit, um, saying to them, you can't manipulate me. I am in charge and I will demonstrate my power over you by giving you this, this test, and if you don't pass it, I will slaughter all of you. I am in charge. And Daniel says, no. No, the Lord changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom, right? So, um, and also, I, perhaps, I suppose, one other way that you could describe Daniel's prayer? He praises God for his providence. Praises God for, for managing this world, managing the, uh, the, the governments of the world, um, giving, giving the knowledge and the wisdom that, uh, that Daniel needed. Yeah, he, he praises God for taking care of him. Um, so he, here is also, I guess, another Another beautiful place where where the, the 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 concepts of providence and prophecy really do meet in Daniel, um, and you see how they work together. Um, now, considering what we have discussed about this prayer in the context of Daniel two, what is God's purpose in both providence and prophecy? If you're going to boil down, boil down to one word, why does God take care of you? Why does God predict the future? What would you say? If you're going to try to boil it down to one word. Why does he do it? Glory. Ah, all right. He is glorified in it. Here's the interesting thing, though. And I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna poke just a little bit. That I would say might be a little bit more result than purpose. Because because does God need to be glorified in that way? I, I don't know. Um, so but but I think it's a really good thought. But what brings God the most glory of all? Anyway, He loves us. Sometimes I ask a question that sounds hard, but it's just another Sunday school answer. Why does God 
Why does God take care of you? Why he does God predict the future? He loves us. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. Right. Um, <laughs> and now you think about that. And as we look at this huge prophecy, this prophecy of how God is. Yeah, I, I think sometimes when we think of God's prophecies, we go, ah, the virgin birth. Really cool. It was this one little thing. I mean, it's obviously the one of the greatest things that happens in the history of the universe, but it's this one little thing. But ah, here in Daniel, we see God predicting the entire scope of history, that he is guiding this, that he is, he is letting us in on this. Why is he doing it? Because he loves you. Um, what implications does that have for your life? Um, the God who loves you, the God or the God who is managing all of this, the God who is doing all of this, the God who knows everything is the God who loves you. I, I just, it makes me feel a whole lot less in, insignificant than I sometimes am tempted to feel. Um, far more important than than I have any right to be. Um, far more precious, far more safe. Um, it's not a random world. It's not an out of control world. Um, the God who loves me is in charge. So um, just stopping every once in a while and asking that question, that good Sunday school question, why does God do what he does? Oh, yeah, um, because he loves me. Um, it makes my day. Um, so now we're going to fill in some blanks. We're going to get into this, this prophecy itself in Daniel chapter 2, verses 24 to 49. And uh, we, we've got uh, this, this statue that's going to be described, and we're also going to get the interpretation that is given. And we're going to try to kind of put that together um, with history. I'm going to do that uh, actually in some slides that I'm going to show you. But I've, I wanted you to have this here. So um, just you wait uh, for my incredibly artistic statue slides. Um, so you're, 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 you're going to love it, uh, I promise. But first, let's do a little reading, 24 to 49. Then Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon, and said to him, do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king, and I will interpret his dream for him. Arioch took Daniel to the king at once and said, I have found a man among the exiles from Judah who can tell the king what his dream means. The king asked Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? Daniel replied, no. And I, I love the fact that Daniel replies with the first word, no. Um, I mean, that shows some courage. You, you don't usually uh, want to uh, say no to a king who's just threatened to kill you and everyone like you. But Daniel replied, no wise man, enchanter, uh, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. Your dream and the visions that passed through your mind as you were lying in bed are these. As your majesty was lying there, your mind turned to things to come, and the revealer of mysteries showed you what is going to happen. As for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because I have greater wisdom than anyone else alive, but so that your majesty may know the interpretation and that you may understand what went through your mind. Your majesty looked, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream, and now we will interpret it to the king. Your majesty, you are the king of kings. 
The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands, he has placed all mankind and, and the beasts of the field and the birds in the sky. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them all. You are that head of gold. After you, another kingdom will arise inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything, and, and as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. Just as you saw that the feet and toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom, yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. As the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will endure, it itself, it will itself endure forever, excuse me. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, but not by human hands, a rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate, prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor and ordered that an offering and incense be presented to him. The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all its wise men. Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon, while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. And then uh, the uh, narrative continues after this immediately into um, the three men in the fiery furnace, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. So... Uh, now, let's look at this. And uh, if you've if you've got uh, this in front of you, let's let's uh, kind of fill these in. So the the head of gold, the head of gold, that one was 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 given to us. That's the, our our nice big softball flying in right over the plate. Who's the head of gold? Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, Babylonian Empire, right? Arms and chest of silver. After Nebuchadnezzar comes a neck, the, 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 the following kingdom. And we actually already studied this uh, and some of the uh, prediction of it. You know, I'm sure Nebuchadnezzar wanted to think that his kingdom will, would never end, that it would endure for all time. But here you have Daniel saying to him, no, your kingdom will fall. It will be replaced. And it was replaced by the Medes and Persians, right? And we saw that in Daniel chapter five uh, that uh, uh, replaced um, yeah, the Persian Empire replaced by, or the Babylonian Empire replaced by the Persian Empire. Now, belly and thighs of, of bronze. After the, uh, um, uh, let me see, where, where are we there? Uh, da, da, da. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will, raise, will rule over the whole earth. You've got something added there that is different. Now the Babylonian kingdom was very great, and yet it wasn't that it wasn't quite as big as some of the uh, uh, empires that would follow. The Persian Empire uh, was replaced by an empire that ruled over the the whole earth, a far far larger one, the Empire of Greece. Greece. Very good. Yeah, you got it. Um, and then finally, the Greek uh, Empire was uh, replaced by a. a uh, um a rome. kingdom of iron rome right yeah and and you think of iron strong as iron for iron breaks and smashes everything Whew. um if the romans were good at anything it was building roads and using those roads to bring armies to places to conquer them right i mean that, that was what they did um i've always found it kind of interesting that rather than create their own culture they were just like no we're just really good at killing people we're going to take the greek culture and make our own yeah, it's kind of what they did. Um, so, um, and also, 
the Roman Empire, uh, one of the reasons why it did uh, crumble, and you can see that in history, is this this disunity within it that it did start to to mix and 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 become weakened in that way and and crumble. Um, so if we go back here, we've got Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian Empire, the uh, the Medo Persian Empire, the the um, Greek Empire, and then you have the Roman Empire, and then you have this stone slash mountain that comes. And this one is probably the most unique of all. Um, so in the time of those kings, the, ki the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. What's the only kingdom that will never be destroyed? Oh I'm sorry, what's that? I, th I heard the kingdom of something. Kingdom of God. Yes, absolutely correct. The kingdom of God. And another name for the kingdom of God is the church. The church. Right? The holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the 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 gods ruling in this world for the benefit <clears throat> of and um uh and and among his people. Uh and so you can see that also the, the kingdom that will never be destroyed, um, but it will itself endure forever. There is no kingdom that endures forever other than the kingdom of God. And um, it, Jesus himself in the New Testament, constantly talking about uh, himself as the son of man. We're, we're going to see that come back. The, the, talking about the kingdom of God that has come near, that is, that is here. Yeah, it, it's, it's right there. It, it's it's uh, um I think that this one is beautifully obvious. <laughs> it's great. Um, and so now as a way to kind of uh, to illustrate that again, so you've got, uh, let me see, here we go. Oh, sorry, I forgot to start this. So we've got the simple version. We've got this statue, right? We've got a head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, legs of iron, feet of iron mixed with clay. Head of gold, Babylon, Chest and arms of silver, the Medo-Persian Empire, belly and thighs of bronze, Greece, legs of iron, Rome, and then you have this stone or mountain, right? What is that? Well, that comes and it crushes the feet of clay and it scatters, right? And it grows to fill the whole earth. That was my amazing um, uh, uh, animation for you. I am an artist. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, but what is that? That is and can only be the Holy Christian Church. What 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 else fits that prophecy, right? So now, um, there are unfortunately other opinions about this. Um, for example, let's look at this one. Somebody out there in the internet thinks that it goes this way: gold, Babylon, fine; silver, Persia, fine; bronze, Greece, fine; iron, Rome, fine; iron mixed with clay. The European Union. <laughs> Why does that not work? Ooh. It can fall as well. Exactly. Right. I mean, we came. Yeah. I. I. Uh, I love this with uh, Brexit. Right. All oh, the other. Uh, the. The. Uh, the um, uh, Great Britain is going to leave the European Union and all this. It's like, you know what? Um, it's it's taking this and saying, oh, it, it why it's got to be the European Union? I don't know. To, to me, this is looking like somebody who just doesn't really like. Um, yeah, you know, when you when you hear people start to talk about this new world order kind of stuff, and you go and and globalism, and they try to make that a very very biblical thing, be careful. Um, the European Union is not the kingdom that is that is not created by uh, by by God's hand, and um, it is not um, it's not going to last forever. Nothing does. No no earthly kingdom does. Um, how about another one? And now this one you can you can see that there are more more dreams that are coming, and we're going to see some of those. Um, but for now, we're just going to focus here. So we've got gold. Um, the uh, 
uh, the head, that would be the Babylonian Empire, right? Silver, chest and arms, Medo-Persian, brass or, or bronze, Greek, great. Iron, legs, Roman, great. Now, prophetic gap. Uh, and then we've got iron, iron and clay, the feet, um, and the, the, the empire of the Antichrist. Um, why does there need to be a prophetic gap in the, in the, the statue is the question I would ask. Um, why are we looking for, all right, we've got to find some way to make a, a space here where in the dream, there isn't a space, Right. Um, and also, this one ends up leaving out the idea of the the hill, mountain, all that sort of thing. But um, here's an example of a a religious group trying to trying to create something to make it fit what they want. Um, so the the uh, uh, the here, let me let me read something for you that I, I I took from the the website where I got this. It says the prophecy evidently contains a time gap because there is nothing in history that corresponds to the empire represented by the feet of iron mixed with clay. Well, not, why not? Why can't that be Rome? In subsequent dreams and visions, the Lord revealed to Daniel that this kingdom of iron mixed with clay would be a loose confederation of ten nations. Daniel seven. It's like okay, whoa, 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 that's a different vision. Be careful that you don't make everything fit together too closely. Uh, this confederation would arise out of the territory of the Empire of Iron, the Roman Empire. Um, whoa, careful. You know, they're, they're taking things and trying to mix them. Um, and then, uh, uh, yeah, they're trying to connect that to the to the uh, um, the Antichrist. They go, all oh, further evidence of a time gap is found in the fact that history fails to show a 10-nation European confederation expanding into a world empire and then being just suddenly destroyed by a super inter supernatural intervention of God. <clears throat> trying to make something work with the rapture and trying to find some way to make, to, to shoehorn what it says into what I think it should say, it doesn't work. It's, it's, it's too... Somebody, somebody, a, a teacher of mine once said, what's the answer that requires the least amount of mental gymnastics? This isn't it. This requires way too much mental gymnastics. Uh, and then finally, another one. Um, fine, head of gold, Babylon, great. Chest and arms of silver, fine. Persia, belly and thighs of, of brass, Greece, great. Legs of iron, Rome. And then feet of iron and miry clay, Rome too in the near future. Once again, we've got that idea of this gap that they're trying to find some way to make this into an example of the uh, uh, you know, the rapture where there's this. You know, God comes and takes the, takes the Christians and leaves all the other people. And it's um, instead of just letting the vision and the words speak for themselves, they're trying to find something to uh, make it work for them. So um, any questions there so far? I know that might have been a little bit of a a little bit of a whole thing, but I wanted to walk you through it. All right. Um, next. Oh, uh, let's uh, just talk about a couple other things quickly. The the authorship of Daniel. We've talked about this before, but I want to bring this back because um, let's let's jump back to our. Uh, well, actually, let's jump forward. I think that's the next one. Ah, yes. Let, let's do timeline time first. Yes, this is the weekly reference to the Daniel timeline. Aren't you excited? Um, what is the scope of this vision? Where does it begin and end on the timeline? So let's let's go um, and uh, take a quick peek at that. It's up in your resources. Um, and and these here are the, 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 what do you call it, PowerPoint that I was just uh, doing for you. You've got it both as a PDF and as the PowerPoint. But here's that Daniel timeline. So the um, the vision begins right here with Daniel and Babylon at the second year of of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, right? So we're we're all the way here. This vision encompasses Babylon, it encompasses Persia, it encompasses the Greek kingdoms, it encompasses the Roman Empire all the way to the fall of the of the Roman Empire, but is that where it ends? 
No. No, because you've got the church being founded and then expanding. It's a kingdom that never ends. So this is a vision that starts here way back at like, I don't know, 600 BC, five, you know, 586 or so BC, way back here and continues off until the end of the world, right? So now, what are the implications of that for your faith? Think about that for a moment. This is saying to you that way back here, God predicted everything, the entire scope of world history until the end of the world. That is huge. If God can do that, yes, he is the true God. Yes, he is eternal. Yes, he is almighty. Yes, he knows everything. Yes, he really is guiding the entire world and all of its history. All of that is true if that is what that if that is what happened here. And here's now I'm going to I'm going to shift back and uh uh let's let's grab some of these things. Um back to the authorship of Daniel. Daniel 9 verse 2. Daniel claims I understood from the scriptures. You know, Daniel's saying, I wrote this. At that time, I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. Daniel's claiming that he wrote it. And who did Jesus say spoke these words? Who did Jesus say wrote them? Daniel, right? So, so Daniel is the author of this book. In the first year of Artaxerxes' reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures. I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. Again, this is Daniel speaking. If now I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to that uh, that timeline again. Well, not quite yet. Just kidding. Awesome thing. When they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, they found copies, scraps of the book of Daniel. So these pieces of parchment, just giving you an example of what they all look like. One of these pieces of parchment, I believe it is, I believe it is this one, was dated to 60 BC. This is a this is a document that, that existed. This this piece of parchment existed before Jesus. Right? We have that. We can see it. Anybody can go and look at it. If that is the case, if we have that those documents that we can see, I mean, honestly, I believe that, that, that Daniel predicted these things. I believe that, that this, because of the Holy Spirit and because of the Bible, right? I, this is true. But if anybody wanted to tell me that instead of Daniel writing this, um, on the timeline, I don't know, way back, you know, you know, Daniel wrote this on the timeline way back here. There are people who try to make this here. They try to take Daniel's predictions and say, Antiochus Epiphanes, one of the uh, one of the kings of the of the the Greek kingdoms, he was the fulfillment of this. So they try to to pack all of those predictions in right here. But we've got a copy of this that was found in a cave in but in in um, uh, southern Palestine, only right here. And then Jesus quotes it here. You're telling me that 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 this got written here, and those that it was they have like nine different copies or copies of Daniel or scraps of Daniel from nine different manuscripts that they found here. Uh, that, that were this old and it was only written here, that makes no sense to me. I don't think that's possible. Um, this is one of those times where we have a very, very clear prophecy that just goes, how, how can Daniel predict something that is so obviously the Roman Empire, and yet we have copies of it that exist really before that era of history happened? Um, it's one of those questions that you either have to answer by believing the Bible or you have to answer by going, no, nah, I just don't want to think about it. <laughs> um, but uh, it's kind of unavoidable.
uh, and amazing what our what our God has done. So I'm very thankful that they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. They're really cool. Um, don't don't need them to go to heaven, but I'm really thankful for. Them. Any any thoughts or questions about that? Did you, did you follow where I was going through all there? All right. Um, back here. So we just talked about uh, authorship of Daniel um, and and uh, Daniel and the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, God's glory and prophecy. He, here is one of the places where we're coming back. Um, at, uh, you know, Lynn, you had mentioned God's glory, and, and uh, you're, you're absolutely right that it is so intimately connected. Uh, Isaiah 44, verse 8, do not tremble, do not be afraid. Did I not proclaim this and foretell it long ago? You are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? No, there is no other rock. I know not one. Um, God is so very insistent that this is his thing, that predicting these things, that, that is something he and only he can do, and that he wants us to know um, that we do not need to be afraid. We do not have to worry. Um, our God truly does rule this world. So, um, and I already kind of talked about this. Who done it? Uh, what about this vision makes late authorship of Daniel impossible? Um, da you know, those those who claim that somebody other than Daniel wrote this hundreds of years after Daniel. Um, it just doesn't work with the evidence that's there. Doesn't it? Doesn't work with the words that are there. Um, and I'm I'm really thankful that it doesn't work because it it's reassuring to me that uh, that my God is is the true God. That my God is real. That my God can can predict the future. Uh, something that nobody else can do. So this one being a little, I, I hope that where where you got to as well was this idea in this place. Isn't it amazing what God can reveal? Isn't it amazing what God can show and see? And 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 when God pulls back the curtain and says, "This is this is what I know. This is what I what I can show you. This is this is what only I can do." Um, I, I find it fascinating that that. Um, yeah, there are a few things more more fascinating than prophecy, and God knows it. Uh, God shows the world who He is when He tells the world what it will be. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it God is saying, "This is what's going to happen to you, world," and I know that because I made you, and I am totally independent of you, and and so much greater than you. So we can't help be in, but be interested, and in God strengthens our faith with His prophecy. Uh, God also puts prophecy into our hands to show to others. Is there someone you know that God could fascinate? Um, there have been so many people uh, from C.S. Lewis to, I, I believe, Lee Strobel to it's all kinds of people that have come at the Bible and said, I'm going to prove that this isn't real. And yet the more that we read it, the more that they read it, uh, the more that they see those prophecies of our God, um, they say, no, I, I can't explain this in any other way other than God is real. Um, and so I um I hope that as we as we have gone through all this that uh, or through this chapter that you'll you'll uh you'll hold even tighter to the fact that your God is is real and that he loves you and that he 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 uh he knows all things and um it's gonna get even better, it's even gonna get even more obvious as we go through these prophecies to see uh just who our God is as we go through. So I, I'm I'm excited for the next couple of weeks, but not next week, um, because I cannot predict for you who will win the election because I'm not God. But I can tell you um, that uh, um, we'll we'll take that week off, and uh, uh, you can all go and vote. and And uh, if if you're interested in in watching election results stuff, you can do that. Um, but I, I will tell you one thing that I do know about next Tuesday is that uh, the Lord your God is in control of it all. Um, he knows exactly what will happen. 
and he has plans to bless you uh, no matter what happens uh, next week in that election, just as he has in the past. So any other uh, thoughts, questions for, for this one? I was wondering if we could have a prayer for mm -hmm. Rick Gray. Yes, Maybe. let's pray for Dion. Um, thank you for uh, thank you for mentioning that. Um, what what would you like to to share with everyone? Why we uh, why we should pray for uh, Rich? I think you go ahead and explain. That's fine. Okay, I will. Um, yes, uh, Dion, who is uh, very often uh, here with us doing this study. Uh, her husband, Rich, uh, needed a, a lung transplant, uh, which is a, um, a topic near and dear to uh, Roberta's heart because uh, her daughter, my cousin Elizabeth, also needed a, a lung transplant uh, not that long ago. Uh, thankfully, um, yeah, praise God, that was uh, successful. Um, and uh, Rich just, oh, just very recently, Roberta, was that yesterday? Yes. That happened? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. 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 Yesterday, he had a successful um, lung uh, transplant. One of the uh, one of the lungs was successfully transplanted, and that will, um, well, you know, thank God that he gave us two because that one will be uh, um, enough to give Rich a, a a greatly improved quality of life and and be a wonderful blessing to him. So, uh, we pray, um, thanking God for for that blessing. And also we'll pray, you know, um, organ donations don't happen unless somebody uh, loses a loved one. Um, so we'll, we will um, pray thanking God for the blessing and also asking God to comfort uh, those who, uh, um, those who have lost. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for guiding and, uh, and ruling this world for our good because you love us. We thank you that uh, that you have been willing to, to pull back the curtain and, and show even us, even, even sinful, ordinary us, um, what is going on behind the scenes, how you are guiding this world. Uh, we praise you for the, the great and loving God that you are. We also thank you that, that you in your, in your infinite wisdom and, and power and guidance uh, provided uh, a lung for Rich, uh, provided um, doctors and medical care and, and wisdom and, and skill that, that enabled that uh, to be transplanted and that to happen. Uh, and we ask that you would guard and keep Rich in this, this recovery that, that can be long, that can be difficult, that can be touch and go. Um, we praise you that it looks good so far. We ask you that you would continue uh, that trajectory and that you would give him um, healing and restoration and strength. Uh, and that you would also give uh, Dion uh, strength of faith in you, um, uh, joy in this good news, and continued trust in you regardless of whatever news she ever gets, um, that, that both of them would be brought closer to you and, uh, and, and held safe in your hands. We also pray uh, for the family that is uh, mourning at this time, um, that, uh, that also you, in, in your wisdom, uh, allowed a, a life to end, uh, and yet uh, brought from that tragedy a, a, uh, um, a blessing for, for Rich and for Dion. Um, we, we do not know uh, that person. We, we hope uh, that uh, that person was was. Uh, a believer in, in Christ and is now eternally with you. Um, and yet we, we also just simply lay all things in your hands, knowing that you are our good and merciful father in heaven and that, um, that we can trust you. And uh, we hope that, uh, that you would give that same comfort and strength to those who are mourning uh, the, the death of that, that organ donor. We pray all these things. In our Savior Jesus' name, our Savior Jesus, who uh, has established the kingdom of God in our world, in our hearts, and will uh, will continue that kingdom forever. And ever. In his name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you very much.
You are most welcome. Thank you all for joining us. And uh, uh, if you have any other further <laughs> thoughts or questions, don't forget to post them. And uh, God bless you all. Uh, see you in two weeks. Thank you, Dave. You're Thank welcome. You. Thank you.